everybody. It's Mike Schumann with The Daily Hoosier here for the E17 podcast, and I am very happy to be joined by none other than Jamie Shaw of On3. Jamie, how are you doing, man? Mike, man, I'm doing really well. Uh, trying to navigate the weather and all that stuff here in the southeast, man, but things are going really well. Hope, hope, yeah. hope, with, you is what, hope with you, too. Yeah, I appreciate you braving a hurricane to, to join me here today. Um, you know, I, I got to say off the top, man, you know, a few years ago when when on three was first announced as a thing, I was like, man, how is that going to work? <laughs> you know, there's so much worthy competition in the industry. But as I've seen it evolve here, you know, with, you know, great hires with guys like you and Joe, like you guys have really emerged to me as like, you know, one of the best in, in the business, constantly breaking news, constantly, you know, with inside information. I just want to say congrats for what you guys have done for the last three years. Mike, man, I, I appreciate it. Uh, we have great leadership, um, and obviously with great leadership becomes a, 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 a clear vision and great hires. So uh, Shane and Terry obviously had a longtime industry uh, icon here, has, has put together an unbelievable team, and, and, and he's uh, put a clear vision together for what he wants out of the company and what he wants uh, the basketball uh, side of things to be and uh, put together a very good team, and, and Joe was just absolutely changing the industry. So Joe Tipton, Tipton Edits, make sure you give him a follow, guys, as well. But he's an absolute rock star when it comes to this stuff. He is, and you're Jamie Shaw 5, correct? Yes, Jamie Shaw 5. Yeah, and give Jamie a follow, too. And su subscribe to On3, I can say, as a subscriber. It, it is a worthwhile subscription. They, You know, what I like about you guys is you, you'll stick your necks out and make predictions, um, you know, even if it's early, just because, you know, that's what people want to want to hear. They want to kind of know what, what the lay of the land is at any particular point in time. And I think you guys do a, a good job of kind of balancing, you know, intel and making things entertaining at the same time. Well, what we try to do, what, our, what, what we – our leadership wants us to do is kind of tell the story. Right. So as we know, recruiting can ebb and flow, especially in this day of NIL and all this other stuff and the portal and everything. Uh, things can ebb and flow within the recruitment. It's very fluid. So what we like to do is, is start early and just tell the story of what we're hearing. Like this school currently has uh, some momentum, but watch out for this school. And then, you know, a couple months later, come back. Well, this school has made a charge and gotten a priority and, and, and watch out for them and all that. So we try to go from start to finish, nut, uh, soup to nuts, and, and, and tell the story of the recruitment. Yeah, and, and speaking of stories of recruitment, so that, that's why I thought of you for this episode, because there's uh, two recruitments that were, you know, around three years for Indiana that, that wrapped up this week. Uh, Indiana offered Trent Sisley and Jalen Harrelson both before they played their first high school game, and they both wrapped up within days of each other. So I wanted to get your take on, on both of those. First with Sisley, who committed to Indiana on Monday, um, you know, a, a guy that I would call a combo forward, um, you know, trying to be a wing has been like even a center or power forward most of his life because he's been tall and, you know, playing at a small school in southern Indiana at Montverde now. Um, what, what's your projection for him, you know, at, at the high major level of college basketball? I think with Sisley, he's a, he's a high floor guy that you know what you're getting with. Um, as, as you said, he's somebody who can step away from the basket this summer with the Indiana elite program. Um, ironically, him and Jalen Harrelson previously were AAU teammates right. and kind of thought of and won uh, together. This past year, Sisley broke away went with the Indiana elite program. I think that really expanded his game playing alongside Malachi Moreno, enabling him to go away from the basket and show um, that he's able to stretch the floor. Um, he shot the corner three ball really well off the catch. Um, he's able to straight line drive off of one or two dribbles off of a, of, of a sloppy closeout, get past his man and uh, create an advantage in that way. And he's also showed to be a, a nice uh, team defender, able to move his feet, slide, understanding angles um, and rebounder as well. So I think Sisley has a high floor of a player of expectations. He fits the modern game with his six foot eight, six foot nine size and ability okay. to stretch the floor and create spacing, which Mike Woodson has shown that he likes with his pro style offense um, from his bigs, being able to stretch the floor a little bit and uh, play that way. Now he's a guy that, you know, he, um, like I said, he, he's trying to move out to the wing, but a, a big challenge for guys trying to do that is whether or not they can defend on the wing. Uh, what have you, Seen him enough to kind of have a take on, on that part of his game? Um, I, I think that his he's a better team defender than he is on ball defender. I, I think off the ball, he's able to, to understand rotations. Uh, he's not quite a rim protector, but he's a nice little paint protector. He's physical. Uh, he doesn't shy away from contact, and he's able to, to switch and rotate around, um, help side, and, and do all that stuff as a team defender. 
Now, now, people will ask me all the time, like, you know, why did he slip down in the rankings? And, uh, um, you know, I think on threes probably got him lower than anybody. And, and I know some of that is like, you know, it depends on when you see a kid, right? You can only watch, you know, 100, 200 kids so many times. Um, you know, I know in July he was coming off having pneumonia and lost like 10 pounds. And, you know, it was really not not in peak form as, as the July Adidas 3 SSB started. Um, what, what's your take? Like, you know, why did he slip down the rankings a little bit? Well, the, the thing with Sisley as to why he, he is a 150 player and why he is a rankable guy, high kid, um, is that high floor. It, it is what he brings to the table in the modern game, especially. Um, the questions that are there revolve around the on-ball defense. Is he a switchable defender or is he a straight um, – is he able to defend threes or is he able to defend fives? The rim protection as a kind of a, a at-the-rim, below-the-rim type guy is in question, but also sliding his feet guarding on the ball. Is he switchable? Um, how does that look? Question marks there as well. Kind of the question marks revolve around the upside. The, um, the, the lower tier, the baseline of what he's going to be is, is clearly there. Clearly an asset, clearly valuable at the high major level. Um, the questions come within the upside as to the dynamic aspects of what you can do, what all you're going to be able to do um, with him as a player. Right. And, and it wasn't all good news for Indiana this week. Jalen Harrelson, who, um, you know, a lot of people thought for years was probably an IU lean, um, you know, clearly wasn't, um, you know, really like the Notre Dame program. You know, I found myself when he was saying – on the, the live broadcast, his reasons for picking Notre Dame, I, I found myself shaking my head in, in understanding his logic. I mean, it, it made sense kind of watching Micah Shrewsbury uh, at, at Penn State and Notre Dame and kind of thinking about how he fits in there. I, you know, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it wasn't incredibly surprising. What, what's your thought and reaction to that, how that wrapped up? Well, it, it, Notre Dame was the school throughout that entire recruitment that everybody involved had their eye on. No, consistently throughout the process, no matter what visit uh, Harrelson was coming off of, while everybody thought Indiana was, as you said, the leader, um, everybody also mentioned Notre Dame as, as I'm watching Notre Dame, Notre Dame and all that. Um, Ryan Owens, uh, former AAU coach in the Indianapolis area, now an assistant coach up there, uh, did a great job building the relationship. Um, and Micah Shrewsbury did a really good job with Harrelson and his crew laying out the plan, showing what they've done with players in the past, Showing, you know, Micah's NBA, all that stuff. Mike Woodson has that as well. But so, so does Shrewsbury. Um, showing what he did in the past with bigger guards at Penn State. And then showing that um, laying out the plan for Harrelson moving forward um, to Notre Dame. And, and, and they were in lockstep with understanding the vision as to exactly how Harrelson was going to be able to get to his ultimate goals um, as a player. I would suspect that's probably about as much as Indiana fans want to hear about Harrelson at this yeah. point. <laughs> so let, let's move on. But before we get into Indiana's remaining 2025 prospects, I, I want to get your take. I think it's really interesting to talk to you from a, a national perspective on Indiana, on Mike Woodson, the staff that they, they've been together for several years now. Um, you know, They started right at the beginning of the NIL era. Um, you know, right when transfer portal and got got hot and heavy. Well, when you talk to people about Indiana, like give me one or two things on the plus side and, and the negative side that you kind of consistently hear about about the program right now. Well, um, on the plus side, uh, when it comes to Indiana, the NBA pedigree, um, you know, his, his time as a head coach in the NBA, understanding what it takes to get to the NBA and also catering kind of a system that's effective in college basketball, but also prepares players toward the NBA. Ultimately, every single, every single prospect that you talk to, every single prospect that you look at entering college basketball has aspirations of playing in the NBA. Um, there's a lot of stuff there about the NBA program, about the NBA experience, about the NBA system um, and all that, uh, that, that Mike Woodson brings to the table that the Indiana program has brought to the table. Um, on, on, I guess, on a negative side of things, there's continued talk about Mike Woodson's job security right. uh, at Indiana. It's been very public. Obviously, last year, Indiana felt the need to put out a statement that Mike, you know, that Mike Woodson was, was secure, maybe even drawing more eyes to the program um, that weren't already there. Um, but that, that seems to be the continued thing that comes up on the negative side um, with Woodson is the job security. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I would have to believe that from a recruit standpoint, that's like the number one thing, right? You can't commit to a program if you don't know the coach is going to be there. Yeah, and, and, and that's brought up um, and that's brought up. Right. So, I mean, it, that kind of transitions to the the remaining recruits. I mean, I think some of these guys that we'll get into will, will have the benefit of seeing how the season plays out for, for Indiana and, and won't have to, to wonder about that. Uh, the guy who's clearly not going to wait that long is Braylon Mullins. He's probably the, the number one prospect on everybody's radar from an Indiana standpoint right now. Uh, down to three schools, Indiana, UConn and North Carolina. Um, do you, do you think it's truly three schools at this point? Um, as it stands currently, uh, you know, he's still a couple of weeks, a month or so away, uh, from his commitment, but as it stands currently, the two schools that I'm hearing the most are Indiana and UConn, um, okay. and those two programs, um, it does sound like there's possibly a split within, you know, as to who's got the particular lead at the moment. UConn has carried a lot of momentum, uh, throughout the process, especially since his official visit going through there. Um, you kind of had momentum, I think, recently. Um, it, it like, um, Indiana has made up ground, if not even even things out, uh, with the process. So, these next couple of weeks, as more players continue to come off the board, like a Jalen Harrelson, uh, today, uh, you, uh, he's supposed to get a commitment today. As more players continue to come off the board, you kind of forgot, um, as things continue to shake out. There, there could be some movement involved with that. But as I'm hearing right now, um, as of us talking, it's set most uh, with Mullins. And, and sorry, you, you broke up a little bit there. I, I was going to ask you, and maybe you said this, um, you know, a lot of people wonder if Darius Adams, if he were to commit to UConn, how that might affect uh, UConn with, with Mullins. They, they seem to me, I've watched them both this summer. They seem to be somewhat similar players, like high volume shooters, um, you know, obviously, you know, in modern college basketball, you, you can't have enough of those. But, you know, from the recruit standpoint, um, I, I've got some indication watching the Mullins recruitment that they are paying attention to, you know, who goes where. Yes, they are paying attention to who go, goes where. I am told on the UConn side of things that. Uh, You there, Jamie? I apologize. I just had a flash flood warning come up on my phone, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we appreciate you braving the elements here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as it comes from a, uh, a, a UConn standpoint, I am told that they will take them both. As it comes from a Mullen standpoint, that seems like a decision that they're going to have to make. Um, we're, we're, what, what does the roster look like? And that seems like a conversation that the UConn staff and the Mullins family are going to have to have. Do you see him as the potential for one and done? As of right now, that's hard to say. I can see him. He has a definite skill set. So when you say potential for one and done, there is potential there, provided he goes to the right system. That system plays out and he continues to develop and go. I would think the more realistic pathway would be multiple years. However, um, Every single year, there's a surprise guy who takes a one-and-done pathway. Mullins has that skill set with positional size, his athleticism, uh, his shooting ability to potentially work his way into that mold, provided things go well. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't project that, but potential, as you said, is, is possibly there. Well, let's talk about a, a few of the other guys here. Uh, you know, one guy who who seems to be running a really quiet recruitment is Bryson Tiller, um, power forward out of Atlanta, overtime elite. Um, I guess first question is, do you see with Indiana taking the commitment from Sicily, you know, that impacting him in any way? Um, I think those two guys could possibly play well together. So watch games, yes, they can play beside each other. Um, when it comes to Tiller's recruitment, it, as you said, it, it has been somewhat quiet. I mean, he's taken official visits to Auburn, uh, Indiana, Providence, Kansas, He's got an upcoming one to Georgia Tech. Um, you know, there hadn't really been a lot of a lot of chatter behind the scenes and his recruitment uh, coming, as you mentioned. Um, so, so with Eric Reby, the um, you know he, he visited Indiana with with Mullins and Sicily. 
um, you know, seems to have had a good visit based on my conversation with him going to Oregon still seem, seems to be down to Oregon, uh, Creighton, Indiana, Yukon and Kansas. Um, you know, Indiana has a really good case with him with immediate playing time opening up and put some guys in the NBA, but obviously competing against Kansas and UConn is going to be a major hurdle there. So um, very good story to come. I think it opened Reby's eyes. The sleeper school for Reby, Creighton, um, just like that, when it comes to playing time, Ryan Caldwell is going to be gone. There's a clear uh, pathway to go with there. They've been kind of the ones that have been looming around for a while. Yes, throughout the process, Kansas and UConn have had momentum for Reby at the time, but the further it gets away from those visits, um, the, the more that kind of opens up a little bit. So every visit that he's gone on, he's at, has been good. Um, things are kind of wide open with him right now um, as, uh, as he continues forward. Um, but the Indiana visit opened eyes and it puts them kind of right there in the mix um, a little bit. While I would say the, the Kansases and the Yukons of the world um, are probably toward the top, Indiana's in the mix. Okay. And then the la last guy in the class I want to ask you about is Mikel Brown. He also recently visited Indiana. Um, I, I guess a couple questions I have about him. Is it correct to think about him as more of a, you know, later type commitment, like maybe even into the spring and, um, you know, you hear about the Adidas thing mattering to him. You know, he's obviously very visibly uh, endorsed by them and Indiana and Kansas are and Louisville are probably the main Adidas schools in basketball right now. So does, does that matter in your perspective? Um, I, I obviously playing Adidas AAU, Adidas high school team and being, you know, a sponsored Adidas guy currently that's in play. I am told. He is looking outside of the Adidas family as well with schools, and that's showing kind of with the with the visits he's going on and he's taking. Obviously, Alabama, uh, Ole Miss, Indiana visits already. Up, uh, he's at Kentucky this weekend. Right. Um, UCF, Arizona, Maryland, all upcoming. Um, his recruitment's trending toward the late period. Um, he he said that he wants to kind of see what these teams look like, who what players go where, and and take his time with the process. Um, yes, the Adidas thing is very real, um, and it's something worth noting. Um, but he's also maintained that he's open to looking outside of the Adidas uh, family as well. And I, I got to believe with Indiana missing on Harrelson and, um, you know, probably needing to show somebody like Brown that they you know, can play – have good guard play this year. That it's probably a better thing that that he's waiting until the spring would be my estimation of things right now. For sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, it's good. And, and Indiana, you know, has some good guards. I mean, right. bringing in Miles Rice, Kane, and Carlisle. You got Galloway coming back. I mean, the depth there at the guard position, um, you know, should be solid. At, at, very, at the very least, solid. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, couple couple just general questions. You know, we we've been doing this NIL thing for three years now, um, more than three years. It, have you seen anything like kind of start to, I, I don't even know how to describe it, just level off, make sense, you know, become predictable, or, or is it just still just wild west out there when it comes to NIL? It, the thing that NIL has brought to the table is it has allowed a lot of fluidity within recruitment. Um, so, while something could be trending one way for a long time, NIL has allowed uh, everything to shift completely um, within the matter of, of seconds, if not, you know, minutes or days. So, no, it, it, <laughs> th th there, there is no consistency with it. Um, I think a lot of the schools are still trying to figure it out. As you see, a lot of programs are now hiring general managers. They're hiring, mm -hmm. um, you know, off the court roles for people to manage rosters recruiting nil all that type of stuff um and, and trying to wrap their arms around it by hiring a full-time position for somebody to, to, to try to manage what that looks like i think there's a lot of uncertainty still um you know you have the the, the possibility of the rev sharing coming up and and all that coming down the pipeline um but as it comes to the recruiting side of things you know it, it, it adds a lot of fluidity and a lot of inconsistencies yeah and Last one for you, kind of along those lines, if you know all the, the time and resources invested into, into recruiting, where, where do you think we're at right now with uh, high major programs, you know, 
recruiting high school prospects versus transfer portal prospects. I mean, the, the fascinating thing about Indiana right now is that they put together that portal class. I mean, there was a lot of behind the scenes work that nobody saw, but you think about Cicely and Harrelson three years and, you know, you, you don't end up landing Jalen Harrelson. That's a lot of time and resources mm -hmm. versus the portal is more analogous to NBA free agency where, you know, you, you, got a quick little turn there and you get somebody that's probably more college ready than, than most of the high school guys. Uh, where, where do you think we're at with all that right now? And I guess it's probably not a, it's probably a program by program question because everybody's got their own theory on how to approach it. But Indiana seems to be like we're recruiting college ready high school guys, or we're just going to focus on the transfer portal. Yeah. So, so what it's shown is that colleges, I, I guess where it's a little bit leveled off is that, Colleges are able to be very specific with the high school guys that they recruit. This is our list of five or six guys that we want. We're going to put our resources into those five or six guys. And however many of those five or six we land, we want. We want to get them in the program. We want to develop them. We want them to play for us um, and, and have them on our roster. Now, if we don't land those five or six guys, we're going to fill in the holes from the transfer portal. Making the transfer portal a little bit more – I don't want to say a dire situation, but, um, you know, a, a little bit more um, – you know, they, they cast a, a bit wider of a net within the transfer portal uh, with, with the amount of players they go after and what they get because they're able to see the entire season what they need on the roster, and then they're able to go out and, and get that position, that player, that skill set out of the transfer portal um, in the hopes of the, the player being ready to hop in the rotation the next year. Whereas a high school kid, you know, they're going to take a – most of them take a little bit of time to, to develop – to get within the system, to get the speed of the game, to get the class schedule right, to get the workout schedule right, all that type of stuff. Um, there's a little bit of more uncertainty with a high school player as to being able to, to, to jump right into the rotation. Um, but, you know, what, what we've seen is that the high major schools focus on five or six guys. They go after hard those five or six guys. And what they don't land, they just go – they don't just go. What they don't land, they go into the portal. They play the season, go into the portal, and then um, – are able to go after what they need, what they feel they need to complete their team. And it's become fascinating because the high school guys that commit at this time of year in the fall commit to a program that ends up looking a lot different once the portal cycles over. It so it, it, it's truly wild how everything's changed in the last few years, but it keeps guys like us busy. <laughs> it, it absolutely does. Uh, yeah. The, the, the portal and everything. And it, it's, it, it, it keeps us busy. Just like you said, there's always uh, moving and shaking going on. And unfortunately for our, our families, that <laughs> I used to promise my wife, you know, after the season, everything will quiet down. But it, a portal season has become the busiest time of year. Yeah. And, and you know, and then you, right when AAU ends, it starts to, the high school visit season. And this has been a very busy high school visit season because the portal put back a lot of timelines. And now the, these players, ha most of them hadn't even taken official visits since after July ended. Um, so then they're they're back to back to back to back getting on official business before this November early signing period. And um, timelines are changing and recruitments are fluid. And just like you said, man, there, there's there's no time for uh, I, I don't even remember what the word vacation means. <laughs> well, that's why we have great people like like you and Joe and on three to, to keep us up to date with everything that's going on. Mike, man, I, I greatly appreciate it. And you continue to do a fantastic job covering the Indiana beat, too. It's uh you know, I, I always try to check in and get the latest and everything of uh, what you got going on and stuff. So you uh, you continue to bring the Hoosier fans uh, great content and very up to date and plugged in. Well, I appreciate that. He is Jamie Shaw of On3. I'm Mike Schumann for the 17th Street Podcast. We will catch you all next time. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Mike.